GPS Speedos was one of the few products that, you know, we're, we're primarily an automotive company. I mean, I don't think that's any surprise to anybody listening here, um, but it's one of the few products that started in marine and went to the automotive side versus the vast majority of everything else we've ever done. You know, those were automotive parts that we added to the marine line. But yeah, GPS was that that rare instance of you know, development on, on the marine side that uh, transitioned over to the automotive and became very popular. You know, the off-road community, God, street riders love GPS speedos. So yeah, there's there's definitely a home for it, all kind of segments of the, the markets that we serve now. Welcome to Power Boat Talk, the podcast where we talk everything performance boats with your host, Joe Rode. Welcome to Power Boat Talk. Today I have with me Mr. Mike Lovro, who is with Autometer, and he is the Director of Instrumentation Sales. And Mike and I have uh, known each other for a long time. Uh, we kind of uh, came together a long time ago when Autometer started doing, or shortly after Autometer started doing marine gauges. And so we're going to talk about that a little today, but uh, thanks, Mike, for coming on. Nice to talk to you as always. Yeah. Yeah. Joe, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, looking forward to our chat. So to start off on some stuff you guys are doing new, obviously you do a lot of automotive gauges and you guys are actually kind of perfecting and, and, doing a lot of uh, digital dashes, bolt-in, uh, easy swap digital dashes for muscle cars. So maybe just for the boat guys I have that, that have hot rods, or at least talk about some of the technology, you can talk about how that how that works and, and uh, what you got going on those. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you're talking about our Envision line of products, which has been an absolute home run for us here over the last few years. You know, I've been with Autometer, gosh, it's been uh, 21 years now. So wow. I've seen a lot of, you know, new products come through and, you know, some are, you know, if we're using baseball terms or whatever, you got the hat on, might as well keep with the baseball terms, but, uh, you know, singles, doubles, some are strikeouts, some are, you know, um, you know, triples, you know, they're good, they're good products, but Envision has been uh, just an absolute killer for us. So yeah, it's, it's a digital dash. That's a 12.3 inch LCD. It's a very high resolution, very bright. Um, easy to see it. And, and you know, regardless of uh, the amount of sunlight or, or light exposure to the dash, uh, you have four screens that you can choose from. Uh, you know, every screen can be uh, programmed on, onto each uh, you know, display. Uh, we have roughly about a dozen different um, direct fit applications currently, and they're all full, you know, six gauge systems. So you've got tachometer, speedometer, uh, fuel level, water temperature, oil pressure, and voltage. So you kind of your, your standard six gauge set and um, you know, we use a, basically a joystick to control that. Uh, we didn't want to use the, the touch screen, didn't want fingerprints and things like that on the dash or, you know, people reaching through the steering wheel trying to, you know, reset their mileage or something. So, yeah, it's a, it's a really, really cool product. Um, so with those six gauges, you're also getting um, individual instrument warnings, uh, both audible and visual. You've got, um, you know, for the car guys, you got the turn signals, uh, high beams, check engine light. Uh, and like I said, those instrument warnings as well. So it's just a, a very dynamic product. Um, even one of the screens does, you know, uh, color changing on it. And then our, our direct fit applications are all, you know, uh, uh, meant to, to be from, you know, in the factory mounting location. So, you know, your original dash just pulls right out. Um, and then this goes right in its place. And it's a, an injection molded dash. So it's going to be more rigid and, uh, you know, than, than the original piece was. So, you know, they're very robust, durable. Um, and, and mount perfectly into the factory locations. But yeah, it's been a great new product for us. We even do a universal one. So, you know, if you have some oddball application that maybe we don't cover or you want to put it into something unique, you know, that's uh, that's an option as well. But um, yeah, Envision's been a really cool product for us. Yeah, cool. Especially the bolt-in aspect uh, for you guys that don't know. I mean, muscle car guys, uh, there's been a, a, obviously, the popularity of muscle cars over the last 20 years has just been incredible. And so guys have a muscle car, they want all the good, cool, new stuff, gauges that actually work, air conditioning, that kind of stuff, but they don't want to cut them up. So that's why the bolt-in stuff's really cool. Um, the other thing about that, now I think, uh, what about like a LS swap applications where you've got some, uh, you know, trying to get LS gauges, trying to get gauges to work with LS senders is a little bit of a task sometimes. So that how, do the, how, do the gauge, the, how do the dashes work in conjunction with LS swaps? Sure. Yeah. Kind of, we have two kind of solutions for that. So um, one is, is if you're using like dedicated sensor inputs, we have what's called our LS install kit. 
And basically that'll include, you know, a handful of adapters to get your, you know, water and oil senders onto the block, as well as, um, you know, adapter for the tax signal. Um, so if you're going that route, you know, like I said, dedicated sensor inputs, you just pick up one of those. Otherwise your other option, if you're uh, retaining the uh, OBD2 port, we offer a product that's called CanBridge. And basically what that does is it plugs directly into the diagnostic port and that's gonna pull whatever available signals you have you know, coming out of the computer. And then you'll, it'll allow basically through a single CAN connection you know, to our Envision uh, dashes, you can just plug that in and it's gonna, whatever signals are available there, it'll just, you know, it just plugs right in and away you go. So you don't have to add you know, redundant water sender, oil sender, other things uh, to the engine. It just you know, grabs that signal straight off the computer uh, and goes right into the Envision. And then the other cool thing about those CAN bridges, you actually drive gauges with it too. So like if you did an nice. LS swap on, um, you know, whatever application and, you, you know, you still wanted to use the traditional round gauges, uh, you could go that route as well. And basically off the box, there's just individual connection points then um, that go directly into those gauges and again, provide whatever, you know, signal you're, you're tapping into for. Okay, perfect. I was, I was just going to ask you that because there's, uh, we're starting to see a lot of LS swaps, it's a lot of jet boat guys doing LS swaps because obviously it's great, affordable horsepower. A zillion of them out there too. Yeah, you know, it's it, one of the things in a boat, it's a little easier because you don't have to worry about the, the accessory drives, which are always an added expense, but boats will just, boats basically just use an alternator. So anyhow, so yeah, it's a, it's a good swap. So I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. So that, that can bus, uh, the adapter will work, work well in that case. Yeah, absolutely. Autometer, I know, was started uh, you know, years ago, family owned company. I think it yeah. was started by the Westberg family. And uh, maybe you tell us a little bit, and I don't know how much you know about that, but been there obviously a long time. How did that all start? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, kind of the, the typical American, you know, uh, pull yourself up by the bootstraps kind of story. I mean, you basically had this family that was, um, you know, doing like sand castings in the backyard. And then, you know, <laughs> at night they would sit there and bring the stuff in and, and assemble gauges literally as a family. And it just started as this, you know, kind of small operation. And then you know, continue to grow. And, you know, whenever I bring up the story about the Westbergs, you know, I feel like I, um, you know, they're, they're, uh, you know, a testament to the company, but at the same time, I feel we really got ourselves on the map um, when, when Jeep were then, and I know you and him had a history back in the day of, you know, working together, but, um, you know, Jeep was the salesman that, you know, went around the country and went to drag races and all sorts of different events, you know, literally like in a conversion van with what was like, you know, converted into a display, like open up the doors and, you know, here's like tachometers and stuff sitting there. And he would go around like at the racetrack with, um, we were the first to have, you know, an electronic tachometer and he would literally go, uh, you know, up to whoever the racer was and be like, Hey, let me check, you know, your mechanical tack versus our electric. And it, it, it outperformed, you know, every single time. And, you know, through attrition, you know, one, one person here, word of mouth gets another person gets another person. And, you know, we went from this, you know, piddly little backyard type company to, um, you know, the, the, the large organization that we are today with, you know, employing hundreds of people and, you know, still based in, in Northern Illinois area. And, you know, so it's, it's really obviously taken off from there, but yeah, between the Westbergs kind of getting it started and, and Jeep really, uh, giving it wings, um, that was, you know, kind of how we got our, our, you know, start. Why, why, how, how gauges, why they pick gauges? How that, how that happened? Ooh, you know, I, that's a good question. You know, I yeah. don't, I don't know the, the story behind huh. that. They were even doing, um, test equipment too, very early on. So like checking your battery alternator starter type devices, you know, we were, um, the, the only company that uses load based, uh, testing when it comes to, you know, testing batteries and things like that. So kind of a, a unique approach and, and first to market with that as well. But no, I, I, you know, I wish I knew that answer, but uh, I, I don't know what, what, uh, what drove them to do that, honestly. Okay. Interesting. So I know um, at some point in the company's history, uh, they were acquired by an investment group of some kind. And um, I always like to tell the story. I've known a lot of companies that have been acquired and it's big in the automotive aftermarket for people to know. know. It's a lot of acquisitions, especially in the last like 10 or 15 years, but your company seems like one of those ones that the group kept you, it flourished, they gave you resources, they, they made some, maybe you could talk about it because it's, it's an amazing thing I saw was the, the change in the way you guys did production. And um, so maybe you can kind of talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's interesting, you know, I started, like I said, 21 years ago. So when I first started, it was still family owned and it was just coming into the transition period of, 
um, being owned by the investment group. The first one that owned us was was Harbor Group. And, you know, when they first came in, you know, there was this thought that, and you looked at their portfolio and it was, oh, they hold on to companies for, you know, three to five years and then they, you know, spin them and, you know, they, they you know, kind of fix some things here and there and make them more profitable. And, you know, a lot of that happened early on, um, but they didn't get rid of us. You know, they hung on to us for quite a while. And um, I think they ended up holding on to us for about 10 years. But some of the cool things that, you know, Harbor brought that, you know, the, the Westbergs were obviously very savvy business people and, you know, employed a lot of people and did a lot of good things. Um, but when you bring in an outside organization, they can kind of look at it differently. They can, you know, kind of take those um, you know, goggles off that, you know, those blinders off and, uh, you know, just look at what the different opportunities are there. So, you know, they came in and made a lot of changes, you know, especially to our, like you said, our production. So we used to have, I mean, really, it was just kind of like these you know, tables set up and, You'd have, you know, one person kind of doing this activity and, you know, they'd do a bunch of this and eventually they'd make it over to this person and they'd do whatever thing that they did. It was it was just kind of very inefficient. So um, we brought in, you know, uh, these, you know, cellular, um, you know, uh, production lines that we have. So basically you would have like uh, one to five people in these things and kind of everybody's got their station that they do. And, um, you know, every every aspect of, of what they're doing. Um, you know, you look at and, and you try to find a way to make it more efficient. So, you know, normally I'm, I'm reaching up here to grab whatever this box is and then, you know, I bring it down and then I do whatever activity I do. And so um, we found ways to, to, to speed that up because at the end of the day, you know, really what it comes down to is how many pieces can you build of that certain part. And if you want to continue to keep your manufacturing in the United States and keep those costs down, you got to have high production numbers. So, um, we would do these uh, Kaizen events and things of that nature where you, you basically get people from different departments. So you'd have somebody from sales and accounting and production and shipping and, you know, wherever else. And essentially we would build these teams and review each of the, the production lines. So I got to do one, gosh, this was probably, you know, 10, 12 years ago or whatever it was at this point. But um, the one I got to participate on was uh, mechanical speedometers. So not not uh, like a pedo marine style, but, you know, your traditional automotive style with the cable. And um, basically in this process, you know, again, we're looking at all these different things to, to speed it up. And, you know, we moved this thing from here to here. And, you know, we moved something from the end of the assembly to the beginning of it. And but the big one that saved us, I think it was something like 17 seconds um, was uh, the fixture that the speedometers went into. Now in the back, there's like a threaded piece that you would have to attach to it and you do your test and then, you know, you take it back off. And like I said, that's roughly about, you know, 17 seconds of work. So they came up with this fixture where you would just drop, you know, the speedometer into this fixture. And instead of threading it in, it would just, you know, click in and then it would do its quick test. You'd pull it out and boom, it's it was done. So, you know, just by that, you know, it's funny you think, oh, 17 seconds, like who cares? Like, what's the big deal? But when you talk about 17 seconds over an eight hour period over and over and over and over again, that adds up to the point where, you know, maybe we were making 50 or whatever it was. And if you can, you know, double your production or add, you know, 50 percent to your production, that's a big, big deal because, you know, it brings your costs down, you know, makes you more profitable. And, and ultimately, those changes that that Harbor came in and did no joke allowed us to stay, you know, manufacturing parts in, in, in the U S where, you know, I think had we just kind of not paid attention to it, eventually, you know, you would have had to look at lesser expensive options for, for production. So. Yeah, it was really interesting. I went back there, like in, I think it was like 2008, 2009, when, when you guys had kind of first started doing that. And it was, it was, it was so simple, you know, when you, when you saw it in, in, talked about it and watch how it worked. And you're like, man, why, why do more people not do this? I mean, it was, um, and, and the thing that helped us when we were selling gauges was now you could, especially on the Marine side where you guys didn't at the time, you guys didn't stock a lot of Marine stuff. So, you know, you could ramp up for two gauges if, if I needed to, you know, and, and your lead time. I mean, there was, there was a lead time. It was a couple two, three weeks, but I knew I'd get it in two, three weeks. Like it was you know, whether I ordered two or 20. So that part was that part was from, from a distributor selling your stuff. That was a really good part of this whole well, thing. And, so. and you know, it's funny you bring that up. Cause like our production now is even faster than that. So like you oh know, pretty much everything, not everything, but four to seven business days. And, you know, we've got um, big, big suppliers that we provide product to, you know, chain stores and things like that. 
that have very, very strict timelines that you have to be mm. able to provide product in. And again, had we not made these changes back years ago, we would have never been able to, you know, fulfill these kind of um, you know, requirements for these various companies. So yeah, the things that used to take us, you know, like your orders that you're talking about back in the day might've taken two weeks. Now we're turning that out in, in just a couple of days and we're building the same building that we always have been too. Yeah, that's, that's neat. A really nice success story. And obviously, I mean, you've been there for 21 years. So, uh, and, and I think you've told me that, that you've got, there's a lot of guys that have been there for a long time, right? Yeah, it's crazy. You know, at 21 years, you know, I, I basically my entire working career I've spent here, which is a, a fun story to share. But, you know, in all reality, like looking at other people in the organization, like I'm still kind of a newbie. I'm still looked at uh, this, you know, young guy, you know, who who came in and, you know, doesn't know anything. I still don't know anything. But, you know, uh, we've got all these people around us, though, that have been there for, you know, 25, 30. Um, we've got a gentleman there. Um, he's been there for over 40 years. And, you know, he's still got a few years yet left in him when, when Jeep finally retired, you know, just a few years ago, um, I think he capped out at like 43 years or something oh like that. But, uh, the one thing I do like to point out though, so I started when I was 17 and, um, if I stay at auto meter, my entire you know working career, I will eventually be the longest, you know, uh, tenured person at auto meter. So that's, you know, a, a cool thing for me, cool accolade that you know, I'm striving for. So I still got a few years, you know, obviously if I, if I'm the, to 43 or whatever, you know, I still got to, you know, a few years to go, but, uh, you know, one day, uh, I, I hope to, to hold that, uh, that award. <laughs> that's awesome. Can't believe it. Somebody put the pen to paper on that one. That's pretty funny. But I mean, geez, who, who does that in this day and age, especially with the yeah, company that's been acquired by investment group. I mean, there's just been so much change and that's, that's amazing. Yeah, when I talk to my my friends or you know other people in the industry, you know, you typically hear you know three years here, five years here, kind of thing, and um, yeah, so it's 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 real cool to be able to share you know how long I've been here, and you know, I, I guess it's a blessing. You know, I'm a relatively young looking guy, so when I tell people that I've worked somewhere for 21 years, they kind of bug eye and you wait, what? How long have you been there? So yeah, it is. It's a it's a badge of honor for sure. Now now when the investment group came in initially because the company had been around for a while at that point, was there a lot of resistance or were you guys kind of asking for change? Like what was kind of the vibe in the company? Um, well, I think the, the family was kind of, you know, ready to, to, to be out, I guess. Um, you know, I think initially when the investment group came in, it was a lot of just kind of um, uncertainty, maybe, you know, that nobody really knew what was going to happen or how things were going to change. And, you know, it's funny, um, I, I do like to point out that although we are corporately owned, I don't feel like it's a corporately run company. You know, I did mention, you know, I'm kind of middle of the road as far as, you know, the, the amount of years that I've spent at Autometer and there's tons of people that have been there longer. So, um, you know, you, you think, you know, hey, if, if this investment group was not somebody you wanted to work for, how many of those people that have been there for 20, 30, whatever years, you know, a lot of those people would have likely have jumped ship and, you know, found, found other work. So while yeah. it is, you know, a corporately owned company, we are still very much uh, kind of a family type company as well. I mean, you know, our leadership team has been there as long as I have been, you know, so that our leadership team came in, you know, right as the, as Harbor acquired us and every one of them that came in is still there. And, you know, you look at a lot of big companies in the industry that, you know, um, are have been acquired by you know a, a, an investment group or whatever it is you know a lot of times that leadership team changes they they come in and they you know cut heads and you know they they get rid of people and that's that's not anything about what we've done through the years you know like i said a lot of those same people are still here and um so just by having so many people that have been there for so long it while it while it may be corporately owned it still has a very much of a, a family feel and i've got you know personal friends that that are there and you know get along with with everybody top to bottom at the company so it's 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 a great atmosphere to to be around for sure yeah that's, that's so unusual but that's 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 awesome and and i'm sure that reflects in you know you'd have to say that reflects in the quality of the product and and how you treat customers and so good good for those guys that's that's awesome yeah absolutely so how'd you become the gauge gauge guy after 21 years ago? How did that happen? 
Well, it's funny. So um, I was not a car guy. I was not a boat guy. I was not an anything guy. When I was a kid, all I cared about was sports. You know, that was that was my thing. I just want to know, you know, when, when was the next game I was playing in or whatever. And um, my dad actually worked at Autometer um, as a sales manager. And, you know, he was a big car guy, big drag racer. He's had, you know, a six second nitrous jigsaw. He's had, you know, Camaros and dragsters and, you know, all sorts of different applications that, that he's toyed around with through the years, boats and jet boats, um, pontoon boats, you know, bass boats. I mean, everything under the sun that, you know, if it's got a motor, he was interested in it. And, you know, sadly, I was not into any of that. <laughs> and, um, you know, I got to 16 and my, my, my friends, you know, all started getting cars. Some of them were working on cars and, you know, I'm looking at these guys, you know, driving these cool cars, going fast and, and all this stuff. And I'm like, wait, wait, you can like do these things, the cars and make them go fast. I mean, how ignorant of me, like my dad was a, a gearhead and I just didn't pay attention to it. And, you know, so he was at Autometer and, you know, I needed a job. And um, so he helped me kind of get my foot in the door. You know, basically, I mean, no joke, I was taking out the trash early on and, you know, doing returns and things like that. So it wasn't like some glamorous, you know, gig that I, I got put into. But um, so I did that basically on a co-op program in high school, kind of half my day at school, half my day at work. And then uh, when I got out of high school, I was, you know, lucky enough to, to intern um, through college. So I did that for four years. Wow. And, um, you know, right at the you know, kind of 07, 08 was when I got out of school. And so the, the economy was in a downturn, but I was fortunate enough to be brought on full time and um, started originally doing OEM sales, you know, kind of helping with like the big three and, you know, any of the, the OEM type applications that we were doing at the time. And, um, you know, eventually kind of worked my way into a, a territory position and did that for, for many years. And, um, you know, kind of got bigger territories, bigger customers. And then eventually, um, you know, enough people left that they were left with just me. So, so you know, then, then uh, I got uh, moved into to director of instrumentation sales here just a couple of years ago. But uh, no, in all seriousness, it's been a, a great ride. I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it. And um, I'm, I'm just a, it's a blessing to, to, to be here at, at such a cool company. And so what's, so what's your data as director of instrumentation sales? Like what's your day to day? Like what, what are you responsible for? I wear a lot of hats. I'll, I'll say that. So, um, you know, I, I still cover a handful of our kind of key accounts. Um, so basically, you know, some of our, our largest accounts, but, um, I also run a team of, of a couple guys here that, um, you know, they obviously have their accounts that they manage. So I work with them to, you know, make sure that they're doing their best with their customers, finding ways to, to grow business with their customers and, um, helping with new product launches. Um, you know, I do all of our like announcements to our customers, whether it's new products, promotions, um, you know, things of that nature, you know, I attend shows, uh, pretty frequently. Uh, I do all of our videos. So like, you know, if we're uh, recording a video about a new product or something like that, I'm the, uh, I'd say talent, but I, I wouldn't call myself talented. Uh, so I'm the body that uh, is, uh, you know, present during those videos and, um, and you know, lots, lots of different things. And uh, just because I've been around so long, I'm kind of the, um, the point man, if you will, uh, for all different departments. So, you know, something happens in accounting or production or purchasing or whatever, and, and they need a, a sales body to answer a question, then, you know, typically that's, that's me that they go through. So yeah, lots of different hats, but, um, I, I enjoy being versatile for sure. Yeah. That's, that's fun to do that. Uh, fun. And it's taxing, uh, when you're, when you're one of the few guys that knows how things go from point A to point B all the way through the cycle, right? Like it's good to have that guy. And it's, it's good because you can, from a sales standpoint, pick out if something's a problem or how to handle anything. Right. But, uh, sometimes that, uh, before you know it, you got a lot of stuff on your plate. So it's but, a juggling uh, act, but, yeah. but you're right. It keeps me busy. Yeah. But it is nice to have the diversity. So, well, cool. Well, good job, man. And that's awesome. I didn't know about the goal of, uh, of finishing as the guy on top at the end. So <laughs> hopefully I'll well, still be I am good. very hopefully. competitive. So, so <laughs> that's uh, definitely something I have in mind. Yeah. Hopefully I'm still around when that happens, man. That's a, that's a while. So, so we talked a little about history and, and this is something I can probably add. We've talked about is cause I have a, uh, when I was at Rex Marine, God, in the early nineties is when we first started selling autometer gauges. And so I have a little uh, background on the history of, of how, automotive got in marine gauges and i know you know some of it and you mentioned jeep 
uh, uh, he was a big part of this. Uh, and actually, you guys at the time, um, you had a, a manufacturer's rep firm called Ballard Allen, and they were out here based yeah. on the West Coast. So they would call us a guy named Jim Marino was was the rep at Ballard Allen. Um, he actually went on to start his own uh, rep firm called West Coast Marketing. He's since retired. That's how long ago it was. But uh, so at the time, you know, Stuart Warner was kind of it as far as marine gauges. Uh, they were kind of it for performance gauges. And they and they had everything. They had the 8,000 RPM tax. They had fuel pressures. They had oil temp. They had all the stuff that a performance boater would want. Uh, Medallion and VD and VDO were kind of around. Uh, they were popular on the OE boats. But they you couldn't get the performance stuff. You couldn't get, again, you couldn't get fuel pressures. You couldn't get 8,000 RPM tax. You couldn't get uh, 120 mile an hour speedos, that kind of stuff. So... Uh, and Gaffrig gauges was a guy named Jim Gaffrig. I think he probably came to you guys originally and kind of had the same idea, basically set up a private label, called it Gaffrig and introduced all the, all the performance type gauges, uh, made it a Marine gauge, whatever that entailed ceiling, uh, came up with gauges that worked with Marine senders. So there was compatibility there and they became really kind of the performance go to and, the other thing they did is they came out with white gauges too. And white just blew up in those days, man. Everybody was using black gauges forever. And when they came out with the white, everybody went a white. And they look really cool when you put a set of white. I actually early on did my own boat. And I remember I took out black gauges and put a dash full of white gauges. It's like, man, it made it was almost like glowing. Like it it really opened up the feel of the dash and the cockpit and everything. So but Jim Marino and probably f with some push from Jeep came to us at Rex Marine and said, Hey, look, why don't you guys come up with a private label line of gauges to compete with Gaffrig and we were all in we were selling Gaffrig but the stuff was very expensive they they weren't they were pretty proud of it and you know I don't blame them they could get the margins because nobody else was selling the stuff but that's uh, right when you're the for, only game in town you can charge what you want yeah and it was good and we used to we talked about it forever because Stuart Warner just kept getting harder and harder to get and then and I don't know what their financial situation was but they they ended up kind of disappearing, but yeah, we, we, I mean, I would take phone calls every day, a guy looking for a fuel pressure to match. And so guys had three different styles of gauges because they'd buy an automotive fuel pressure or whatever, nothing matched the Marine gauges. So, so we started on a, a Marine line of gauges called, I think we used your, oh, I think it was a Z series gauge. Sure. What, okay. Yeah. So that's black what we on black, right? Yep. And then, and that was the thing we did. We said, look, if we're going to do this, we need to do white. So we spent a lot of time working on screens, the artwork, um, worked on a lot of like, okay, here's how a marine oil pressure, here's the ohm reading of a marine oil pressure. So it's compatible with 80 PSI marine senders. Same with water temp. Uh, fuel level gauges are kind of common on marine, the, the, sen the, the sender, the ohm level yep, on the sender. So. Yeah, so any, I mean, we started that and, and uh, you know, you guys were busy at the time. Your production wasn't as fast. Uh, we probably spent a year, year and a half trying to get all those gauges in the line. And, and in the meantime, and I don't remember if, if Mike who owned Rex at the time or, or Jim, but at some point we said, Hey, well, can we sell pro comp gauges in the meantime? And we're like, absolutely. And we said, well, if we're going to do pro comp gauges, which is two and five eights gauges, uh, we need the Marine stuff. So we kind of pivoted a little bit, started working with you guys on doing Marine, the ohm readings, the, the, the screen. So how things would be laid out. And that's kind of how we got started in Marine. And I don't, I don't think on a lot of those things you guys were doing it until we did that. And then of course, once we did it, you guys had them, it went into your, went into your um, your line and now everybody everybody sells the marine gauges you know summit sells them and jags and the whole bit but yeah that's kind of my little history and i'll in fact i think early on you and i uh got together because um i i didn't have the greatest customer service guy there and you were in customer service at the time and came along and did what you said you were going to do and it worked out real well so i always have a kind of a, a place in my heart with automator because of that and and doing those doing that whole line of gauges but um yeah, it's cool, and it's cool to see uh, where it's gone and and uh, how, uh, how how it's still popular stuff. I mean, it's kind of, uh, I mean, with you and Lavorsi, it's kind of the only game in town for for good performance gauges, you know. So yeah, there's there's not a lot out there. Yeah, you know? and we're still expanding the marine line. Like we've still, as of the last couple of years, you know, added um, wide band air fuel ratio gauges oh, and cool. um, newer style fuel pressure gauges. Uh, we even have EGTs that that people can do. So. You know, um, we're not, uh, it's not an afterthought for us by, by any stretch. And, you know, we're always looking to, to add more stuff to it. So if there's other things we need to be doing, anybody listening, you know, shoot us an email, give us a call, let us know what you're looking for so we can, you know, put it on the list. Now, now kind of the core of the gauge of a Marine gauge, your Marine line and your, in your 
performance racing lines components inside the gauge are pretty much the same so your your race gauges are just as durable as a marine gauge um what's what are there any differences on the marine gauge uh, there are so yeah just just to take a quick step back to just kind of highlight what you were saying there so you know basically the the internals of a marine gauge are the same internals that are used on a drag race application or you know whatever road race application i mean you know, a short sweep electric and, and ultra lights the same as a short sweep electric in our, our marine line and same with something mechanical. So all those, you know, tried and true track tested, you know, uh, products that are in our automotive line internally are the same uh, on the marine side. And uh, really the, the main difference between a marine instrument and uh, the automotive stuff is, is two things. One is the front ceiling. Um, so, you know, we allow that, uh, you know, we put a, basically a gasket on the front to you know, prevent any kind of, um, you know, water getting through from the front side. And then uh, we also use a, a special additive in the paint on the pointer uh, that prevents sun fades. So obviously in, in a boating application, you're, you're pretty much exposed to the sun at all times. And uh, just by prolonged sun exposure can cause things to fade. So um, so we use that, that different paint in there to keep that pointer looking fresh for longer than it would be, you know, if you had an automotive one in that same application. Yeah, and you know, that you bring that up, I think that was part of the problem when we first were working with you guys on the marine gauges. I think that was something that um, held us up because luckily somebody or in the process, we knew we had to do something different with the UV rating on the needles. And uh, I remember them testing all kinds of different paint because the, the early stuff wouldn't pass the UV resistance. Um, so I, I forgot about that, but you're right. Cause I remember seeing faded, we, we were chained, we were trying all different kinds of oranges and, and, uh, and, but luckily we were smart enough to test them to make sure that, uh, or you guys were smart enough to test and make sure that they, we didn't have that problem. So luckily we did that before they got out in the field and we were replacing the gauges, but I forgot. Yes, our, our, our very high tech, uh, thing of angling a gauge towards the sun and letting it sit there for an extended period of time. Very, <laughs> very high tech stuff there. But yeah. yeah, I mean, it's important to do those things. I mean, you got to you know, make sure that the it's a quality product. I mean, the last thing you want to do is, you know, put something out into the industry that, you know, uh, six months later or whatever, somebody comes back and like, hey, this, you know, was a red pointer. And now it's like a dingy orange, like what gives? Like, we didn't want any of that. And, um, you know, we, we do very well with the marine stuff. We don't get, you know, it, it, people are very happy with, with the quality that, that we've put together for sure. Now, is there anything, if a guy's <laughs> buying a marine gauge or should he know about if he buys a marine gauge compatibility with senders anything like that um for the most part our marine gauges are meant to use our sending units there are very few kind of instances where like you can use like a mercury um we have like a water temp gauge that pairs up to um, a merc sender and um, you know fuel level you can use aftermarket senders as long as the resistance range pairs up but um, no, and anymore nowadays, you know, most of our stuff is going to be kind of paired to, to our senders, which is an important thing to know. And th and that's not just exclusive to us, whether it's a, you know, a, a Lavorsi or a Stuart Warner or VDO, you know, insert gauge manufacturer name here. Um, you know, everybody's going to have their own sending units and same for the OEs. So, you know, everyone's going to have kind of their own secret sauce and how they want that to, to work, whether it's, uh, you know, voltage or, or resistance. Um, so just something to keep in mind on any gauge purchase is that, you know, you got to make sure the gauge is paired to the right sending unit because, you know, in something like a fuel level, it could read backwards or, you know, peg the gauge out. And yeah, we've had all sorts of kind of tech questions through the years of, oh, why is this working like this? Well, do you have the right sender? I don't know. I use the one that came in the boat, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. So it's important to know what you have and and so that you can pair it, you know, to, to the right device. But um yeah, I mean, even like things like GPS speedos, you know, ours are, are compatible with with our sender or even aftermarket ones. So we have some products that are even versatile to the point where they can work with multiple devices. Um, so it kind of it depends on the scenario or what you're using. But for the most part, yeah, I got to make sure you're using our senders with our gauges. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say from years of selling gauges, I think that's the biggest question. It's the biggest issue nine times out of 10. If, if a guy had an issue, it's because he had the wrong sender. Um, and some of, yeah, some of your, like your ADPSI, the Marine, there's kind of a real standard Marine ohm reading on, uh, ADPSI senders. So most of the time, if you have a boat, you buy an ADPSI gauge, your stock sender is going to work, but best, best thing, if in doubt, just, you know, buy the thing with, uh, with a, the compatible sense sender and that way you don't have to worry about it. But that, that'd be my thing to say it ups the price a little bit, but then it's, it's accurate. And the other thing is some of the senders, 
even if it's not 100% compatible, it might work, but it's, it could be off and you don't even really know it's off. So yeah, if and right. if and uh, yeah, that's that, that was probably the biggest tech question we got. And, and you mentioned GPS speedometers. I mean, probably one of the aftermarket parts that made one of the biggest differences through the years in uh, aftermarket marine performance marine was a GPS speedometer. So that was, I, I, I know at Rex, we, we had a line of high performance pressure speedometers, which for those of you who don't know, I mean, a standard marine speedometer basically works off pressure, picks up pressure, water pressure, runs it up a little tube and the, and the speedometer is basically a pressure gauge that's calibrated miles per hour. So when the GPS came out, I mean, it was, it was a big deal. Do you remember much about that or how that happened? You know, that was like right as I was coming into the marine, you know, side of the business. Um, so I was pretty young at that point, um, but I do remember the impact that it had. And, you know, we, we've taken those to a, to a whole new level now. So like, you know, originally you had to use, you know, uh, somebody else's um, antenna receiver. And, you know, we had like a special connector on the back that you had to mate it to. And I mean, it worked really well. It was a game changer because you never had to worry about, you know, clogged or bent pedo tubes or anything like that. It was just, you know, you, you put this uh, hockey puck looking thing on the dash or, you know, uh, wherever it could see a, a satellite signal and it just kind of worked. Um, you know, whereas, you know, the mechanical stuff, it might be a little jumpy and like I said, you know, clogged or bent pedo tubes can be a hassle to deal with. So yeah, when the, the GPS stuff came out, it was, you know, it took off like gangbusters and, you know, now we've got even cooler ones. Like the original ones we did was, was just a speedo. It was just a blank dial and, you know, it just read your speed. Um, the ones we do now, you know, have like a, for lack of a better term, like kind of a, a scoreboard looking screen on the bottom that actually like scrolls you know, information across the screen wow. and it gives you like latitude and longitude, directional heading, peak speed, date and time. There's even an hour meter built into it. So, you know, kind of these um, extra features that, you know, you wouldn't have had on the, the early versions are now, you know, standard on, on all of our GPS speedos. Yeah, that was a cool thing. And, and you, the cool, the other cool thing is, I mean, it, 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 it came in being on the Marine side. I mean, it was a big game changer for us and it was, other than we had a bunch of speedometers we could never sell after that. But, um, it, you know, it just made everything so much easier for everybody. There was accuracy. Marine speedometers were never, you always question accuracy. So now it was 100% accuracy. Well, I got to ask you a question, uh, Joe. Um, yeah. So I was told early on, and, and I don't know if there's any truth to this, and I, I don't think we ultimately did it because it would have made them inaccurate. But I was told that when we first were releasing speedos for the Marine market, that they wanted them to be inaccurately high so that boater, you know, could kind of brag to his buddies like, oh, I'm going 60 miles an hour when they're actually doing like 50 or whatever. Was there, was there any truth to that request back in the day? Can you, can you tell me anything about that? So no, actually, so Norsgog, Bob Norsgog was the first guy that had a performance marine speedometer. And he's the first guy that did the really nice stainless steel pedo tube. He actually had a quick release mount but he built those for his race boats. And he actually used to use them in the old days when they were testing boats. And they, of course, got out of them as well, too. At some point, Bob died and then that company kind of, they weren't doing much with them. But when when we were working with Autumn Heater to come up with that marine speedometer, I spoke with Eric Norsgog and I said, hey, I'm trying to come up with speedometers, but I'm trying to figure out the pressure rating. And I'm testing these Stuart Warner's video speedometers and they're kind of goofy. They don't seem like we can't kind of get a read on them. And he, at the time, since they weren't doing it, he goes, hey, I'll tell you what, here's, here's, the, here's the equation. And it was like 1.6 pounds for whatever. He had an equation and a sweep. And when he gave me that sweep, he told me, now listen, my grandpa, when he made these, he made them 100% accurate. But I know the cheap ones, the videos, the Frias, that kind of stuff, they are always read higher than ours. And that was one thing my grandfather didn't like, the fact that and and that was probably why. I mean, you can only surmise that that was the reason why the boat manufacturers wanted a couple more miles per hour. But that's that's all I've heard about that. But anyhow, yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, we had to, it took us a while to figure that that, that equation. And then uh, a speedometer, like a pressure speedometer, don't aren't they like an air core movement inside? It's just like a standard pressure movement. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's it's the same as like a, an oil pressure gauge, basically. So so that if I remember correctly, don't they use like they use like a brass almost like a piece of channel like a really thin channel and then doesn't it fill mm -hmm. that thing up and then it's it's a curled thing 
And as it gets pressure in it, that brass actually kind of straightens out. And that's how you move the needle as that thing straightens yeah, out. It's pretty, pretty unique. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's kind of, as the pressure increases, that moves more or less or whatever. Anyhow, it's kind of a weird equation how it all works mathematically. That's funny. I, yeah, that was one thing that, yeah, somebody told me early on. I never knew if there was any truth to it, but it sounds like there, yeah. there was. Not not by us. We, we, makes sense. Everything we do we, has to be, you know, dead on. You know, there, there's no exception to that at all. Um, but I do remember that. And I think it was probably one of those ego things that, you know, somebody wants to say they're boats faster than, yeah. than what it really is right right well and for those people that came in the boating industry after the gps speedometer it was so much nicer because it's part of, especially selling parts like we just they were always clogged they were always wrong they were out and then you know when you're when selling gps don't lie exactly and when you're selling performance parts you know like when a speedometer is off and you're trying to justify the guy just spent two thousand dollars for an exhaust system in his boat didn't go any faster you know it's like did it really not go any faster? Is your speedometer just off? Like you didn't, right? Anyhow, so yeah, nice little. And then, and then you know the smart thing was, I mean, you guys that technology got into cars, and now because it, although it wasn't as archaic of a technology in cars, cars would use electronic speedometers where they use a sensor that would measure like drive shaft speed, I think, and so it was more accurate. But still, in the cars, you still had the you always had to recalibrate that thing. It was kind of a pain in the ass cook with cars too. Yeah, it changed tire size, gear ratio, yeah. or whatever. It would, you know, affect your speed reading and you'd have to recalibrate it. Yeah, GPS, you just set it up. It doesn't matter, you know, where you're at or what you're doing or how big your tires are or any of that. It just grabs that satellite signal and, you know, away you go. But that was yeah. funny, you know, GPS Speedos was one of the few products that, you know, we're, we're primarily an automotive company. I mean, I don't think that's any surprise to anybody listening here, um, but it's one of the few products that, started in marine and went to the automotive side versus the vast majority of everything else we've ever done you know i was talking about the, some of the new stuff we added the air fuel ratio the you know the fuel pressure and um pyrometers and things of that nature that we added here over the last few years you know those were automotive parts that we added to the marine line but yeah gps was that that rare instance of um you know development on on the marine side that uh transitioned over to the automotive and became very popular, you know, the off-road community, got street riders, love GPS speedos. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely a home for it um, in, in all kind of segments of the, the markets that we serve now. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I think, I think again, with the electronic speedometers in cars, I think guys were just like, eh, it's okay. It was not that big. But with boats, with the, with the pressure speedometer in a boat, like everybody hated them. That's all we thought about. I mean, we, I remember Mike and I, we were doing those speedometers a hundred years ago at Rex. We were always thinking, God, is there a better way? Is there a better way? Is there a better way? You know? And then when it came, I think the car guy's like, Oh, this is stupid. This is way easy. So but, yeah, right. interesting, yeah. interesting, stupid little part like that. But yeah, I wanted to ask one thing and I don't even know if it's that big of a deal anymore, but I mean, it was kind of interesting to me, but so you have the air core movements, which is basic, most basic gauges using air core movement, which is kind of a mechanical thing moves and electro turns into a center sensor and that's how it works. But you also have stepper motor gauges and a stepper motor gauge actually has like a, what, a little computer, a little microchip in it, right? More or less. Yeah. And then you know, basically a, a system of gears that step, that's where the stepper motor term <laughs> comes from. Um, and it's a much more accurate and precise uh, movement than than an air core is. And, and where in the boats, why I, I always like this, and it was with fuel pressure gauges, when you guys did the stepper motor gauges, it was really cool because carbureted applications, obviously, they need like a zero to 15 gauge. But when you have a zero to 15 sweep on an electric gauge, a standard gauge is a real short sweep. It's hard to show the accuracy. But on a stepper motor gauge, it's a, it's a 370 degree sweep or... 200, so, 200. Yeah, 270. Yep. And yeah. yeah, a typical short sweep electric gauge is anywhere from 90 to 110 degrees of, you know, range of motion. So you're kind of talking about like a V, you know, approximately. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, when you start getting into the full sweep, then you're able to utilize more of the gauge face, more like a mechanical gauge would. And that's going to allow you to get a more precise reading because you have so much more of the dial face to work with that you can more accurately pinpoint exactly what that pressure was. So yeah, if you're talking about a, you know, a short sweep and from here to here is, you know, two pressure, you know, two PSI versus, you know, you got this full dial, you know, mm -hmm. uh, two PSI could be a pretty significant, you know, movement uh, on the pointer. So yeah, that was a, a big advancement to be able to have those, you know, stepper motors as opposed to just using the short sweep electrics. 
Yeah, and again, in the Marine side, that was where it's something that really stand out to us because we always fought with fuel pressure because the few people that made electric fuel pressure gauges, that, that little short sweep, you could, they were totally inaccurate. So the stepper, obviously, because it's it's a better instrumentation, you know, more advanced, so it's more accurate. And then on a boat, just for you guys to know, obviously, the performance guys that really want accuracy, they like to use mechanical gauges, right? So you're running oil line up to your dash, but the last thing you want to do is run a fuel pressure line up to your gas. So that's why it's really important to have electric, all electric on the fuel side, uh, because you definitely don't run, run fuel up through the, you know, the length of the boat up into the dash. So it's better to run an electric gauge. Yeah. So, the only way you could run a mechanical would be to use like an isolator and then you're adding, you know, another piece to the puzzle. Um, but that isolator then, you know, basically a fuel come into this little isolator and then from the isolator to the gauge, is then a mixture of half antifreeze, half mm-hmm. water. So if you ever had a, a failure or whatever in the line or something like that, you know, you'd be shot with antifreeze and water versus you know, fuel all over the car, oh, which go. is not anything that anybody wants to mess around with. So, but yeah, to, to your point, um, you know, using an electric fuel pressure gauge inside the vehicle, definitely the, the only way to go for sure. Yeah. And again, that, that, that was why the stepper motor always stood out to me because they were so accurate and they had the longer sweep. So Anyhow, just wanted to point that out. Maybe not, maybe nothing anybody wants to talk about. But another thing with marine gauges is, you know, marine guys love their colors, right? So I think you guys have some options if a guy wants to mix and match bezel colors, face colors. How, how does that work with you guys? So we partner with a, a company that does that, that does the color customization. Um, so somebody like CP Performance, you know, basically you can go hop on their website and you know, they can put a green bezel or orange bezel or yellow or white or chrome or, you know, whatever color configuration you're looking for. So that's a service that that they offer. Oh, okay. um, I think you're maybe referring to like our custom shop, which is something that we also um, have done in the past and are, are looking to, to, to relaunch here. Um, and that was basically a, um, a complete custom setup of, of instrumentation. So, you know, the customer hops on this website and you know, I want a, a, a white dial with the Gothic font that's pink and a, a green pointer and, you know, whatever it is. I want to put uh, the number 56 on the, you know, middle of the dial. I mean, literally any aspect of it you could you could customize. And we had some really cool kind of projects that that came through, um, you know, through the years of, of those. But one that always, you know, kind of stood out to me was um, one that a, a customer did where basically we sent them a tack and speedo dial just just a dial blank and sent it to them and then they painted it um but they painted it in a, a like a two tone theme um but it was the coyote you know chasing the the oh. road runner so it was this this cool kind of art graphic you know in their dashboard and uh, they did a, an amazing job at at painting the, the the scene and then they sent it back to us and then we just screened you know the the speedometer and the tachometer artwork over the top of the uh, the, the the artwork that they had put together and basically then they had this cool little like scene on, on their dashboard. So yeah, we've done all sorts of different projects in the past and, you know, we do have the ability to do customization, um, you know, primarily, you know, dial, you know, taking existing uh, components that we have and, you know, uh, reconfiguring them into something unique for, for a customer. Okay. So they can, they can just contact you to do that or is it something you only do through CP? Um, the, the bezel customization is definitely a CP thing. Um, you know, for us, it's, you know, we can take any of our existing bezels, you know, black bezel or a chrome bezel. And, you know, as long as the gauge sizes match up and we have the colors available, yeah, you, you can switch those over. That would be a special order. Um, yeah, obviously there's a little bit of an upcharge to do that kind of thing, but it is, you know, something that we do have the capability of doing. Um, you, we can get into more unique type builds and, um, at some point, we'll relaunch the custom shop website where that customer can go in and on the website, just sit there and through pull down menus or whatever, you know, kind of pick and choose how they want their gauge to look. Um, in the more kind of immediate future, yeah, we can do bezel changes and a pointer change gotcha. and things like that. Um, but, but yeah, you, you want to call us to, to kind of get anything like that queued up. Gotcha. So if a guy wants a gauge that you offer like an ultralight, but he doesn't see it in the Marine or whatever, you can mix and match and do, do it that way. Yeah, for the most part, yeah, you definitely yeah. want to. It's a case by case basis, and gotcha. it's gonna, you know, you're definitely gonna want to call us and make sure it's something that we can do. But certainly, it's a conversation we're happy to have. Gotcha. Cool. Okay. Well, good. I think that uh, I think that will cover you guys on the marine stuff. We can people know 
what they can come to you for. And obviously, man, boat again, boat guys love customized stuff. So more colors, the better. Yeah, exactly. It's insane. These, some of these boats, they just, they just get crazier and crazier. So in closing, uh, personally, we've heard about your history. Why don't you tell us something about yourself that, uh, maybe a hobby or something about yourself that's unique or something you like that maybe people would be interested to, to hear that you, that you're into. Um, well, I'm into a lot of things, primarily fitness. Fitness is definitely my, my big thing. Um, I'm, I'm working from home today. If I peeled back the, uh, the backdrop here, um, you would see my gym behind me. Um, nice. so I'll, I'll I'm not going to expose that cause my furnace and some other stuff are over there too. Maybe a little embarrassing, but, um, but yeah, that fitness is, is my big thing. I'm a big sports buff. I, I love any sport really. Um, but I think I know where you were going with this one. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll shoot myself in the foot. I am the a uh, rare American who, who loves soccer. Um, so I, I refereed for, for many years. Uh, I'm not doing it currently, but, um, I think I refereed for something like eight years, um, got out of it maybe a few years ago. Um, but it was a, you know, a good excuse to, to get exercise, get paid to do it and, uh, you know, give back to my community. But, you know, growing up, I played basketball, football, golf, soccer, cross country, you know, track. I mean, I pretty much did it all. Um, and, uh, just, it was always very competitive kind of growing up, but yeah, I fell in love with soccer in, in 2008, my dad took me on a, a business trip with him to Europe and, uh, one of his customers, uh, took us to, uh, it was like a second tier, you know, English, uh, match, uh, I could tell you the teams, but I don't think anybody here is going to know who they <laughs> were. So, um, but, but think of it like the equivalent of, you know, double a baseball or, or whatever. And, um, you know, there's like 30,000 people at this thing, just screaming, going nuts. And it was just kind of a, a culture shock for me. You know, I'd, you know, seen it on TV and, you know, played as a kid and that kind of stuff. And, you know, it was okay. It wasn't my, my cup of tea at the time, but yeah, I got kind of thrown into this atmosphere and I was just absolutely blown away. It was one of the coolest experiences I'd ever done. And then, um, we went back to Europe on my honeymoon with my wife, um, in, uh, back in, uh, 2013. And uh, we went to a, another match in, in Germany, and that was, you know, a bigger crowd and a more crazy atmosphere. And it was a first division game, so it was just at another level. So I've always been into that. But, you know, I, I love sports in general. I do fantasy football. I'm a big Bears fan, Sox fan, you know, Blackhawks, um, hate the Cubs. But, uh, you know, outside of that, uh, anything Chicago and sports, I, I'm very much into and, and follow it all. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was going there with the soccer thing. My, my kids play soccer. I had one son that played all the way up through college. So Mike and I talked through the years when I found out he was a soccer fan, but or he's under promoting how much he's into <laughs> soccer. I don't want to, I don't want to shoot all my legs and feet and arms. I mean, I, I know it's not the most popular sport here, so I have to tamp it down a little bit and, and make sure people know that uh, I love all sports and not just that one. So I'm just a, a little bit different of an animal here in the States. That's for sure. Well, yeah, but you've actually you were actually ahead of the curve because we were talking the other day. I mean, man, on on there's so much streaming stuff now, like Ted Lasso and the and the Ryan Reynolds team and the Beckham. I mean, there's soccer all over the place now. So you were ahead of the curve. So <laughs> thanks, Joe. I appreciate that. <laughs> but yeah, and you actually, I think you actually told me, don't you pay for like a, I don't know what it's called, some soccer TV thing where you get like every. Oh, game I, yeah, and... I've got I've got everything. <laughs> yeah, I bought a, the box. It wasn't specifically for that, but yes, I have a uh, subscriptions and boxes for, for all sorts of different things. So yeah, I could watch like Chinese league soccer if I really wanted to, I don't, but I could, if I, if I wanted to. Yeah. Well, that's fun. That's, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So, uh, yeah. All right. Well, cool. Uh, well, Hey man, thanks for coming on. We had a little technical difficulty, but we, we got it figured out. You sound great. Um, is there anything we missed you think, or no, no, well? I appreciate you having me on. This was a, a pleasure to do these. I always enjoy speaking with you and uh you know i'm glad to see you're still participating in the industry and you know look forward to to continue to talk with you and you know down the road here and um no thanks for having me on it's it's been a blast all right well thanks for taking the time and for all the information and uh you guys obviously autometers everywhere online uh you know facebook instagram autometer.com i believe and so easy to find but uh yeah uh hit them up for for anything you're looking for in the boat so all right, Mike. Thanks again. Thanks for uh, taking the time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, man. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Powerboat Talk. 
If you like what you've heard, please head over to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star review. For more Powerboat Talk, follow us on Facebook or Instagram, or visit our website at powerboattalk.com.